Good day guys, welcome back to Wiki Science YouTube channel. In this video, we'll be talking about metals, non-metals, semiconductors, and we'll focus more on semiconductors, which will be describing charge carriers of semiconductors. We'll be talking about the types of carrier action. We'll focus on the energy band model, we'll talk about the types of semiconductor, as well as dopants and doping. We end it up with diode and B biasing of diode let's get started what is a metal a metal can be said to be specifically one good deep uh, a metal is a conductor of electricity that is they have high conductive ability why Non-metals, non-metals, on the other hand, are said to be non-conductors of electricity. When we are now to describe semiconductors, semiconductors, they are partially conductive. Then I'll show you reason for this. The charge carriers of conductors is usually electron. You can have them to be ions. You can have them to be holes. It can be protons. For example, in metals, there are two regions in which this charge carriers can be found and the first one is called the field valence band and the empty conduction band in case of metals electrons are found in the field valence band in which they can easily jump into a region where we have the empty conduction band region that is slightly depolarized to give a local positive charge so here i have electrons electrons these electrons occupy the field valence electron bound and as a result of that they can easily jump into the empty conduction band when these electrons they gain energy when they gain energy they jump into the empty conduction band and as a result of this electric current can easily flow from one region to another through the words charge carriers for metals this is for metals. For non-metals, we can have something like this, in which between the field valence band and the empty conduction band, there is a space. There is a space. Even though we have electrons here, these electrons we have to cross over this space to enter into the conduction band where we have a local word, positive word, charges. They will need to gain minimum amount of energy to cross over this particular space. This space is called the energy gap. Why is it called energy gap? Because a minimum energy is required to cross over this gap in order to enter into the world, into the empty conduction band. This is for non-metals. For semiconductors, for semiconductors, we have that 
The energy gap is also found in semiconductors, but in this sense, the energy gap is reduced compared to non-metals, which is having large energy gap. Meaning that the energy to overcome here is quite reduced compared to non-metals. So we can have something like 0.3 volts or 0.7 volts of this energy gap to be what? Overcome. So this is our energy gap for semiconductors. For semiconductors. In which this region become our what? Our field, field energy band. And this other region becomes our what? Empty conduction band. So they will have to overcome this energy in order to enter into this region. Now, it is quite necessary to know that for all of these that we described, for metals, don't forget, metals do not have any energy gap in between. And as a result of that, charges can flow from the field energy band to the what? To the empty conduction band easily. Charges can flow without any need to overcome any energy. Now, when does this occur? This only occur when energy carriers such as electron gain energy. They become mobile and jump from one word energy bound to another. This postulate that which we have about metals, non-metals, and semiconductor that covers the aspect of the field valence electron band and the empty conduction band is what we refer to as the band model. It's called the band model. So in a nutshell, we can see a bound model postulates the arrangement of charge carriers in a confined form for the flow of electric current. Very good. Now let's get to the aspect of what then are the types of charge carriers. When it comes to the case of semiconductors, the charge carriers are usually electrons and holes. Now these electrons forms what we refer to as free electron C. Free electron C. Semiconductors are said to be partially conductive. The question is why? We pick silicon for example. We pick silicon. For silicon, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Semiconductors they have partially filled. They have partially filled orbital. They have partially filled orbital, and this partially filled orbital do not allow what do not allow free electrons to be formed because the atoms are covalently bonded together. When I say the atoms are covalently bonded together, this is what it means. In silicon lattice, in silicon lattice, that is, a lattice contains as many as possible silicon. You will always have another silicon atom, which is going to donate, according to the structure, we donate one electron. If I have another silicon atom, we donate another what? Electron. If I have another silicon atom here, we donate electron. If I have another silicon atom up here, it will donate what? Electron. And it makes this particular lattice to be completely filled orbital. 
when we have a completely filled orbital, then this particular silicon lattice would be non-conductive. So in a, in, a, in a nutshell, I can say that semiconductors, when they are covalently bonded together, they are non-conductive. But we, we've said earlier that they are partially conductive. What makes them partially conductive? The reason they are said to be partially conductive is that despite the fact they are covalently bonded together, electrons here they vibrate in their what fixed lattice and as they vibrate in their fixed lattice they gain energy and once they gain energy they can displace they can be displaced from the what from the bounded region to become free though this is what this is not usually common so you don't really have as many as possible free electrons so let's assume this particular silicon atom is dissociated and we have the electron here to be what? The electron here to be free. When the electron here is free and we have a conduction region here, this electron here can easily jump into this conduction region and it makes this particular silicon lattice to be partially what? To be partially conductive. Okay. To understand this better, I'll quickly use a pocket to explain this. Now, how many electrons do you have in the atomic shell? You have four. Four electrons. We have four free valence electrons. Now, let's see. We ought to have eight. So, let's see the eight now. Let's see how we can have the eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This will be used to represent the pocket of silicon atom or silicon lattice. Now, how many electrons as we said to be free or oh, free valence electron? Four. So I can have one donated here, another one donated here, another one donated here, and another one donated here. Are we together? One, two, three, four. Meaning that we are still left with one, two, three, four that are yet to be bounded together. This is what I'm now saying, that when this electron vibrates in this region and become what? They become separated from what? From their covalent bond. I can have it to be here. Then this free valence electron that has what? Been displaced from what? From their mobile lattice can enter into this region. While this is done, the energy obtained by this electron can cause this electron to create a conductivity or generate a potential which will make this lattice to become what? Conductive. You can see that there is a space in between the first conductive region and the second conductive region. This particular gap between them is what we refer to as what? Energy gap. So they must overcome this energy gap before they can enter into another conduction region. Okay, what are the types of semiconductors? We have two types of semiconductors. The first one is called pure semiconductor. We have two types of semiconductor. We have the pure semiconductor and we have the impure semiconductors. Types of semiconductors. We have the pure and we have the impure. These pure semiconductors, they are also called intrinsic semiconductors. Why these impure semiconductors, they are called what? Extrinsic semiconductors. The reason they are called pure semiconductors is that the conductivity of semiconductor here contain the atom of that semiconductor alone, nothing but the semiconductor alone. So if I have silicon lattice, the silicon lattice is only made up of silicon atom alone, nothing more. 
It is only made up of silicon atom alone, nothing more. That's the reason why we call it a pure semiconductor. In the other way around, I cannot say it, pure semiconductors, they are what? Non-conductive. Why did I say that they are non-conductive? I believe you all know that. Because they are what? Covalently bounded in their what? Structure. But with temp as temperature increases, the dissociation of electron from their bounded region, they displace and enter into another conduction gap and it causes them to be what? To slightly what? Depolarize and cause energy to flow through. So that's the reason we say they are non conductive. Just get that. Now, in pure semiconductors, they are said to be extrinsic. And here, they are what? They are what? Improved. I can say they are improved conductor. What makes them improved conductor? They are improved conductor because they are mixed with, with another material to become conductive. So, an impure semiconductor is a conductor that is having the component of its atom with another atom. For example, let's have silicon. To this silicon atom now, I can actually mix it up with another word, atom. What is that atom? I can mix it up with atom like aluminum. And how many electrons do we have in aluminum? We have three various electrons. Three. One, two, three. When we mix it up with electrons from another atom, let's see what happens here. This electron is completely donated to this silicon atom. This is silicon atom now. We have one electron donated here. We have another electron donated here. And we have another electron donated here. But you realize that there is still one more pocket to be filled. And this pocket that is meant to be filled is called a hole. It's called a hole. The remaining pocket that is left to be filled is called a hole. So here, what happened is that this hole, for electron to enter, since electron is negatively charged, and according to electrostatic law, unlike charges attract, Definitely, it means that what will attract this negative charge must be a what? Positive charge. So I can say that a hole is a local positive what? Charge. Whenever you have positive charge, the first letter of positive is P. The first letter of positive is what? P. So in this case, since we have O left here, since we have O left here, we call this a P-type, a P-type in pure semiconductor, a P-type in pure semiconductor. Let's take it on the other way by considering another word, atom. Let's consider atom like, don't forget, we are mixing it up with another atom. It does not contain silicon atom below now, but in association with other words, atom. Let's consider another atom here. Let's consider atom like phosphorus. When we consider phosphorus now, we have phosphorus is having how many electrons? Phosphorus is having five free valence electrons. So I can have one, two, three, four, five. Now, if I have five free valence electrons, let's see what happens. This phosphorus will donate its electron to the what? To the silicon atom. And here you have it. One. You have another one here. Two. You have another one here. Three. You have another one here. You have another one here. Four. And you have another one. But that other electron that is coming is having nowhere to bind. So here it is found free. The electron will be found free. And as the electron is found free, this electron begins to allow what conduction of what? Of electricity. So in this case now, we have excess electron 
Now, don't forget, what makes metals conductive is as a result of what? Excess electron in their galaxies. So, here now, we have made a semiconductor to be in that state that it is having what? Excess valence electron. Having a low conduction region to be bound with. So, in this case, electrons are what? They are negative. So, the first letter of negative is what? N. So, we call it N type in pure semiconductor. So, meaning that by donating electron from other atom into semiconductors, they can become more conductive. Meaning that we are improving the conductive property. This process is called doping. This process is called doping. So what we have actually done is called doping. So what is doping? Doping is a process by which electron from other atom is donated to semiconductors in order to improve the conductive property of semiconductors. And those atoms that are donating electrons, those atoms that are donating electrons are called dopants. So now, what made this semiconductor lattice to be impure is the presence of phosphorus. So I will call this phosphorus the dopant. So what are dopants? Dopants are the impurity. What makes this particular semiconductor to be impure is as a result of phosphorus. So I will call this phosphorus impure substance. Then we call this substance dopant. So what are dopants? Dopants are the impurities added to semiconductor in order to improve the word conductive property of semiconductor. Now we arrive at diode. Now what can we say about diode? We use this idea of doping to improve the conductive property of semiconductor and we call them diode. We call them diode. What are diode? Let's assume this is a plate of semiconductor. I believe we know what we mean by P-type and N-type semiconductors already. Now, after getting a P-type semiconductor, this is a P-type semiconductor. It is arranged on a lattice. That is, it is implanted on the lattice of a semiconductor. This one that we've drawn is a semiconductor. But this P-type is implanted on this semiconductor. Then we now make, we make another word, N-type semiconductor. The N-type semiconductor is also implanted on another region of this semiconductor lattice. They will call it a what? A diode. We call it a diode. We have two things to be recognized with here. We call them majority and we have minority. Majority means what you have in excess. Minority means what you have less. And if this is a P-type semiconductor, and this one is what? N-type semiconductor. What do you have as P? Positive, we all know it is what? Holes. So it means that I have holes here. I have holes. And what do you have in N-type? What you have basically in N-type semiconductor is what? Electrons. What you have, what makes it N is because you have excess electrons. So the majority here, majority would what? Electron. Majority here would be what? The majority here would be what? O. Definitely the minority here would be what? The minority would be what? O. And here the minority would be what? The minority would be electron. Now, from this arrangement, you can see that there is a gap, just like you have in energy band model of normal semiconductor. You have a gap here. Now, this gap you have, in a pure semiconductor is called energy gap. But for in pure semiconductor, we call it energy barrier or we call it a barrier potential. So this is called barrier potential.
Why is it called barrier potential? It is called a barrier potential because electrons will have to jump across this region to enter into the what? Conduction band. That's why we call them a barrier potential. As well as, don't forget, this is called a P type and this is called the word N type. As a result of that, it is called P N junction. So what is PN junction? PN junction is a region between the P-type semiconductor and the N-type semiconductor. And why do we call it a barrier potential? It's called a barrier potential because energy must be what overcome here in order to enter the what the conduction region. That's what we mean by a diode. Now the symbol for diode is given this way. This is the symbol for diode. When you see this in an electric circuit, it simply means a what? A diode. It simply means a diode. Now let's move further to um, biasing a diode. How do you bias a diode? How do you bias a diode? Now the biasing diode is talking about the form in which diode will take when it is placed in an electric circuit. The way diode will act in an electric circuit is called diode bias. Now let's see. In this case now, we want to introduce an electric circuit. Don't forget, if you are introducing an electric circuit, we have a terminal here, we can have another terminal here. Now, when we have these two terminal, when we have these two terminal, we connect it to an electric circuit where you have a source voltage, like a battery. Now, let's put a battery here. If this is a battery now, the way I can arrange this battery is such that I can put my positive terminal here, and my negative terminal here. If my positive terminal here, this is my positive and this is my negative, it will continue and um, extend to the other end of the diode. When it continues and extend to the other end of the diode, do not forget what do you have here? P type. And what are P? Positive charge. So it means we have positive, 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 positive. And what do you have here? N type. And what are N type? They are the negative electrons. So we have negative, 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 negative. Now see what this means. It means that when this is connected, the, according to electrostatic law, positive and positive will what? Repel. When they repel each other, it means that this end and this end, they will repel each other. And by the time they repel each other, it will therefore cause this positive charge, this arranged here, to jump forward. They will jump forward because there is what? Repulsion. Likewise, this is negative and this is negative. When this end and this end touches each other, it will cause them to what? To repel each other and jump forward. So this is what? Repulsion. In a nutshell, it simply means electrons, as they gain energy, they jump forward to enter into the what? Conduction band or the conduction region. So here, as they enter into the conduction region, so it means that this place will become what? Negative, 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 negative. And as these ones, they enter into the what? As they, as they become fueled by the electrons, to create their um, potential towards the electron, they become what? Positive, 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 positive. This is what we refer to as this type of arrangement or setup is called forward bias. Do not forget, I said biasing a diode is the nature or behavior of diode when connected to a what? When connected in an electric circuit. So when this particular conduction band approach each other, it is called a forward bias. Why? Because these electrons they gain energy, they host, they have minimum energy. And as they these electrons they become depolarized, they host, they become depolarized, they attract each other. And as they attract each other, I can have something like this. The electrons and the words conduction band they attract each other. So it's cause a gap, this gap that you have here, to be closed up. 
Because what we feel this place now, they are the what? Electrons and the hole. They close off and allow currents that which you have carried by what? Electron depolarization to flow. Electron flows. Because there is no more what? There is no more space. This caused the energy barrier to be overcome. Now let's take it on the other way around in a reverse bias. For a reverse bias, the same type of diode is used. The same type of diode is used. The same diode is used. We have the P type. We have the N type. And don't forget, we are conducting it. We, we are connecting it to what? To a circuit. In the first connection, we use this particular part to be our positive terminal. Here, what will be our terminal now? The negative terminal. So this is negative. And what do you have here? You have something like this. So this is our positive terminal. This is our negative terminal. What do you have here? Positive charges again. Okay, let's fill this place up with our positive charges. Fill it up with our positive charges. And here we have our negative charges. We have our negative charges. Now let's see what we have here. Here now. Here now, the positive charges that you have here, let's see what happens to them, and negative charges that are here. According to electrostatic law, positive and negative, what happens to them? They are trapped. So this one head towards this region, this one head towards this region, and they attract each other. What do you think will happen? All the positive regions that we have here, all the positive regions here, what happened? They begin to shift back, 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 like this. The positive region begin to what? Head towards the region of what? Attraction. They head towards the region of attraction in this way. They head towards the region of attraction, meaning that they are going towards the region of what? Attraction. Now, let's see what happens to the negative charge. Positive and negative. What do you think happens? Attraction. Attraction. As this attraction continues, the electrons here begin to move towards what? Positive charges. So, let's see what happens. The electrons that you have here, close to the what? Barrier. Energy barrier. They begin to migrate towards the site of attraction. So, this one is migrating towards the site of attraction. And what happens here? They are migrating towards the site of attraction. So here, they continue their journey like that towards the side of attraction. You can see the way the arrow points. It points towards the side of attraction. What happens here? It causes the gap between the P and the N. What do you call it? P N junction. To what? To widen. To widen up. It widens up. And as it widens up, we get the flow of current. No, because. The space in between them, the charge carriers cannot flow through. They are going in opposite direction. So, electric current cannot flow through this particular space. In the forward reaction, in, in the forward bias, there is flow of current. In the reverse bias, there is no flow of current. Let's begin to think of this now. When I put on the switch, current flow. In, in that case now, putting on the switch is what? Forward bias. If I put off the switch, the current will not flow. What is that? Reverse bias. Meaning that it can be taken as a switch. So a diode can be had as a switch. At the same time, can take off these two abilities. When it takes off these two abilities, it's taken as a rectifier. And act as a switch or as a rectifier. That is when you now use. Uh, we talk about that when we use uh, an alternating circuit, not more a DC. So this is a DC now, this is a DC. When you use alternating circuit, it acts as a rectifier. And when you say it acts as a rectifier, it means that it allows current to flow in just one direction. It allows current to flow in just one direction. And AC it allows current in um, alternating directions. But rectifier allows current in just one direction. So this is one of the usefulness of diode. So this one is called a forward bias and this is called reverse bias.
bias. So in our next video, we'll be talking about half-wave rectifier. Watch out for it.